I just received a package from China. It's kind of a safety care package. Just stuff I need to add to my woodworking equipment to make it safer. It primarily consists of running lights. The type of lights you'd find on CNC machines to see if they're working, if they're operational, and so on. I want to use them on my woodworking equipment to indicate if the tools are plugged into the wall and if the tools are powered. There's a million different ways to get injured on a piece of equipment, and one of those ways consists of you assuming your machine is off when it really isn't. I've heard of many examples of this happening, and it's really something you want to protect yourself from. The typical accident usually consists of somebody using a machine's tabletop to store wood on it while they're working on another machine, and when they reach back for a piece of wood, they put their hand into the tool that is running. Of course, having blade guards on your machine will make a drastic difference, but sometimes the blade guards aren't enough. Blade guards tend to be removed every now and then for different operations, and you can never truly be sure the blade guards are in place. Plus, safety is all about redundancy, and you can never really be sure how an accident will take place, so having more than one safety feature is very important. You may find your machine to be loud and obnoxious, and you may assume that you can always tell when your machine is on or off, but this really isn't the case. When you're in the workshop, you're probably wearing earmuffs and maybe listening to music, but worst of all, you may have left your table saw running, but then powered up your bandsaw, and you won't know your table saw is still running because the sound of the bandsaw will cover it up. I also ordered some new buttons, which look great considering how much I paid for them. I'll start with the jointer because it's probably going to be the easiest one. Sawdust seems to accumulate inside the cabinet. I decided to change out the wires for longer ones instead of just extending the wires, which could have caused a bad connection, which could have started a fire inside the cabinet. The circuit is fairly simple. I'm gonna go directly to the switch, which has on one side 120 volts AC, and on the other, the motor. Next, I'm gonna take the two light bulbs, connecting one on the input side of the switch and one on the output side of the switch. The other two wires of the light bulbs, which are already connected internally together, are going to be connected to the other side of the 120 volts AC connection. This way, as long as the machine is connected into the wall, the green light is lit. And if the machine is turned on, the red light also lights up. It's important to note that if your switch is a single pole switch and not a double pole switch, such as in the case of a light switch, the current will just go straight through both light bulbs and back out. This is probably not enough to power the motor, but both lights will stay on. Typical light switches, as you'll see replaced on usually old machines that the original switch is no longer around, are a terrible choice of switch. Never use light switches for a machine. First off, they're not rated for an inductive load whatsoever, but on top of that, they're super dangerous because a piece of wood could simply fall on them and they could turn on. If you choose to use them at the detriment of your safety, make sure you use them upside down. If they're upside down so you have to pull up to turn them on, at least a piece of wood can't fall on them and turn them on in theory, but you could still just bump them or a piece of wood could fall in a really bad way where it could get caught underneath and push up as it falls a little bit. It's just not a good way. A switch designed to turn on a piece of machinery or a motor is usually going to have a lip around it. That way if something butts against it, it won't turn on the machine. It has to be a deliberate finger that pushes inside the switch to turn it on. If you care for your fingers, I suggest getting switches adapted for machinery. Even cheap switches off eBay that probably don't have any real security rating on them are going to be a much superior choice to a light switch for your machine. The lathe is exactly the same routine, but with a slightly more sophisticated way of mounting the light itself.
But light bulbs, especially when connected to 120 instead of 240 volts, are quite dim and I don't like it. I'm gonna buy LED bulbs, but I didn't have time during this video. The changes to the shaper are going to be quite a bit more significant as I'm also going to move the buttons around and it also uses a magnetic switch, which is going to be a little bit different. This video is quite long and it slowly spirals completely off course, but I swear it's quite... well, you'll see. Machinery with magnetic switches use what we call motor contactors. It's just like a regular switch, but instead of being activated by a mechanical force, it's activated by an electromechanical force. To activate it, it needs current on the input side. For the scope of this video, the important part to remember is that it's treated just like a regular mechanical switch. You have a light connected to the input side and a light connected to the output side of the switch. Or the contactor in this case. Since this uses a motor contactor, we can easily relocate the switches to wherever we want. All I have to do is remove the wires and add new switches. Since the switches are just turning on and off an electric coil, you don't actually need switches rated to what the motor is rated to. This is particularly useful when dealing with 3 horsepower motors that are going to run at 11 amps, and that doesn't even take into consideration the initial inductance load. This here is an overpower fuse which I've never tripped, and I don't think they trip often, so I'll mark it on the enclosure in case it one day flips. I moved the whole enclosure inside, which doesn't leave any room for the off switch, so I have to go inside the enclosure to reset it. But it's so hideous, and I'll probably never trip that fuse, so, you know. I should mention that the reason I moved the switches was because I felt they were unsafe. I mean, they were ugly, but they were also unsafe. To turn the machine on and off, I had to bend down with my head close to the blade, or at least in the line of the blade, which I think is very unsafe. Additionally, I like to be able to turn my tools off with a movement of the hip. This is especially useful if there's a tool where, if something went wrong, you might still need to hold onto the material to not have major kickback. In my opinion, the only exception to this rule is the bandsaw, because it doesn't really give kickback, and the drill press, because it also doesn't really give kickback. Every other tool, I like to be able to turn the blade off without actually taking my hands off to work. For the bandsaw, I'm just going to mount the light directly on top.
drill press is going to require some more sophisticated circuitry to control the buzzer, and to achieve that, we need to go to my second favorite place after the workshop. I should mention, if you don't like insects, just skip a minute. Entomology look a little bit more dramatic than it really is, but you know. This buzzer was initially controlled by 120 volts, and I want to control it with 5 volts, so now I'm just checking if it has a built in oscillator and at what voltage it runs at. Turns out the buzzer does have its own oscillator, and it runs at 12 volts, so in the end, I'm just controlling it with a MOSFET. drill press was severely underrated. I actually wired all its contact in parallel to pretend it could do a full horsepower, but that's a terrible way of doing things. This new contactor is actually correctly rated for the machine. Naturally, I wired the contactor upside down and burnt out some parts, so now I have some little surgery to do. drill press, you must either deactivate the dead man switch or press it down with your foot. The loud buzzer can be deactivated and activated with a switch. There's two auxiliary light switches. And, as with every drill press, the pneumatic quill feed pressure can be adjusted with this potentiometer and the red button activates it. After that, another button dumps the air, and there's a button to manually turn on the pump without going through the computer. The drill press can also be set to automatically turn on if the quill goes down, which is super practical especially for saving time. Additionally, it can be set to use a dead man switch pedal as an on button. If the pedal is released, the power goes off. If the dead man switch is bypassed in the regular mode, it automatically becomes an emergency stop button, so if you press it, the drill press will stop. You're probably not surprised to learn that the drill press didn't come looking anything like this. It actually started its life as a 22 inch king drill press. It's quite a large drill press, at least it's quite large compared to a typical woodworking drill press. 
And while that's because it's not really a woodworking drill press, it's aimed a lot more towards metalworking. It's twice as heavy as your typical woodworking drill press. It's a lot larger. This makes for a super stable and practical machine for metalworking, but it's also fantastic for woodworking. The larger table is super useful, and the table has proper 5 8 of an inch T-tracks, which is really nice for setups. You can also fit a full-size machining vise, which is way more accurate and a lot more precise than any other vise on the market. Of course, to justify all the effort and time into making and sustaining a machine like this means it sees quite an important workload throughout the day. Okay, okay, but on a more serious note, check this out. I bought a light for the table saw too, but while filming this, the old delta finally bit the dust. It was broken beyond repair. Soon enough, new boxes showed up and it was replaced by a brand new saw stop. Stripped of all its valuables, the delta was left in the frigid rain to rust, lusting after the days where it used to play a critical role in the workshop. I can't say I don't feel bad, but its days of glory were over. This is my table saw. It's in no way, shape, or form of bad. Okay, I made it all dramatic again, but to be fair, a video about lights and safety is getting a little bit boring. If you have your own tricks or way you modified your tools for safety around the workshop, I'd really love to hear about it. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider subscribing and liking. If you want more content because I'm kind of slow at publishing, check out my Instagram, I post a lot of random stuff on there. And uh, see you next time!